I fell into the Moloch trap, right? Being obsessed with beating my, right. my arch rival, dun, 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 you know, when there was no real game at play. There was no game. The game was a complete artificial narrative in my head. That, I think, is a part of the Moloch trap. So it's like this idea of false zero-sumness. False zero-sumness, right. Seeing a fixed pie when there isn't one. And, and remember, there's no fixed rules, there's no agreed-upon objectives, and there's no agreed-upon timeframes. Mm-hmm. So I'm literally inventing a game that doesn't exist. And my sense of winning or losing depends on where I'm looking. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Win Win Podcast. Today, I am speaking to the inimitable Simon Sinek. Now, Simon's known for many things, but he's probably best known for being a thought leader around leadership itself. He's written a number of books, including Find Your Why, Leaders Eat Last, and most recently, The Infinite Game. And The Infinite Game is one of the reasons I wanted to speak to him, because it arguably captures the win-win ethos better than almost any book I've ever read. We also get into the topic of speaking. I actually got to know Simon on the speaking circuit where I would be standing on the side waiting for my turn to go, absolutely racked with nerves, and then see him go out there and just deliver the most beautiful talk that enraptures audiences. And he shares some of his secrets of how he does that in this conversation as well. He's also a fierce optimist, and we explore his approach to harnessing the power of optimism, even in difficult times. So lots of good stuff. I loved speaking to him. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's dig in. So Simon, you wrote this book called Infinite Games, Mm -hmm. which is probably the most win-win book I could imagine. Um, It's actually based off James Cass's Mm -hmm. Finite and Infinite Games. Mm -hmm. I guess to start with, can you explain what the Infinite Game is or what the difference is between these two sort of types of games? As Dr. Cars defined, um, a finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective. Football, baseball. Um, If there's a winner, necessarily they have to be losers. Mm -hmm. And more important, there's always a beginning, a middle, and an end, always. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means you don't necessarily know who all the players are, and new players can join at any time. The rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want, and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. We are players in infinite games every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. Um, there's no such thing as winning global politics. Um, uh, you will never win career. Right? Mm-hmm. Nobody's declared the winner of career. Um, there's no such thing as winning business. Uh, you know, Businesses are playing, they're doing their thing, but nobody wins business. Which, if you think about it, um, when you listen to the language of so many leaders, what I find so curious is they don't know the game they're playing in. So many leaders who are playing in infinite games talk about being number one, being the best, or beating their competition. Based on what? Mm. Based upon what agreed upon metrics, objectives, and timeframes. And this becomes a problem, and this is where it overlaps with your work, which is when you play in an infinite game with a finite mindset, when you play to win when there is no finish line, there are some consistent and predictable outcomes. Um, The big ones are the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, and the decline of uh, innovation. Um, And so win-win is recognizing, and businesses like this, business is an infinite game, that multiple companies selling similar products, similar services, about the same price, about the same quality, can all be wildly successful simultaneously. Okay, so what what happens if you use an infinite mindset in a finite game? Well, that's not very good either. You know, um, because if you're playing football, for example, And while you're in the game, you're not really concerned about what the score is at the end of the game because, uh-huh. you know, the game will go on forever. Well, you're going to lose because there, as, there's, there is actually an end to the game and there is one declared a winner and one declared a loser. So that, that's no use. You have to play with the mindset and the rules of the game that you're in. So if you're in a finite game, you have to play with a finite mindset. If you're in an infinite game, you play with an infinite mindset. However, and this is where this, things get a little more fun, which is... Um, uh, the finite, the, the infinite game is not the absence of finite games. It's the context within which those finite games exist. So for example, when you're actually playing on the field, playing the game, of course you should be playing to win, of course. However, 
you're also practicing. You're also uh, developing relationships with the other players. You also mm -hmm. have a coach. And the best coaches, ironically, the John Woodens and folks like him, the best coaches, the most successful coaches in the world, ironically, are not obsessed with winning. They're obsessed with team building. They're obsessed with the, the relationships that their players have so that when they play the finite game, they're more likely to win. Right. And so the infinite games can still exist because you're not always in a finite game. And same in business, is right? There are finite games in business, of course. Like if you're in a pitch, right? There's an agreed upon time frame. There's going to be an adjudicator. Someone's going to choose, a, we want to work with you or you. There's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. You're going to win a pitch or you're going to lose a pitch, right? Um, but then it continues. Like it, that's not, that, that game is over, but now you continue to play the infinite game of business. Uh, an election. An election is a finite game. There's a beginning, middle, and end. Right. There's ag agreed upon only one rules. Winner. There's agreed upon rules. There's only one winner. Mm -hmm. There's going to be losers. But the minute you win your election, you now have to stop playing the finite game of win my election, win my election, and you now move into governance, which is or governing, which is now infinite mindset. The problem we have in our political system, for example, is they're always playing to win the election, even when they're not in an election. So is that a function of the time horizons between these like little finite games within the infinite game of, of politics are, is too narrow because it's like only a four-year term? Is that like the cost you pay for having these short-term cy cycles? I mean, there's no simple answer to that. Like in the UK, the length of a campaign is governed by law. Right. You know, so there's a time for campaigning so everybody knows it starts. There's also laws that govern sort of um, how much TV, you know, if you have a certain amount of TV you know, the other person has to be on TV an equal amount of time. So they, they govern a fairness. In America, you know, our elections seem, they start campaigning earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, there's a whole host of reasons for that. And I guess, you know, at a macro level, which would explain the election component, but also why too many of our business leaders are playing with an excessive amount of finite mindset, um, is we have misaligned incentive structures. Right. Too much money in the system. Wait, what do you mean too much money in the system? <laughs> So let's let's back into it, right? So you have misaligned incentive structures where um, I'm going to bonus you based on a short-term result, right. right? So the number of people who get individual pay packages, not team pay packages, not group pay packages, individual team packages, in the case of too many executives, based on the price of the equity, at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter, that means the only thing I really care about is the end of the year or the end of the quarter because my pay package depends on it. Mm -hmm. And so I will make decisions that may be bad for the longevity and survivability of this company, but shit, I got rich along the way. And there's, you know, businesses littered with case studies like that. Um, let's take one really quick one, Kodak, mm -hmm. right? Kodak, huge company. They invented... Film, right? Well, they didn't invent... Yes, they invented film as we know it, sort of like self-contained on yeah. a spool film, yes. Uh, George Eastman invented that. Uh, the founder of Kodak. Um, and they invented many, many things because George Eastman's obsession was democratizing and simplifying photography, which used to be complicated, expensive, caustic, dirt, you know, dangerous. Um, and he made it simple and safe and any anyone can do it. You just drop it in and go, you know? Um, and Kodak made its money from chemicals, from film, from processing, from paper. Um, huge enterprise. And in 19, I think it was 1973 or 1975, a Kodak engineer um, invented the digital camera. And when he showed it to the executives, they like couldn't imagine having to completely cannibalize and undo this huge company they had for this new technology. So they decided to suppress the technology. And they weren't that stupid. They knew that once the genie's out of the, 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 right. the lamp, like there's no putting it back, right? And so they, they predicted that they had about a 10-year window. And sure enough, to the year, they actually their prediction was really good. Um, exactly 10 years later, digital cameras started to show up on the market um, by uh, Canon and Fuji, so Japanese companies. And funnily enough, they were using patents. They were using licenses for the patents that Kodak owned. So the digital technology inside these Japanese cameras was actually, it was actually, Kodak, was actually Kodak technology. And we know what happened with digital cameras. They became a thing. Mm -hmm. And on paper, well, and in reality, I guess, Kodak made tons of money on the patents, on the licenses. And then the patents ran out, and Kodak went into steep decline and eventually declared bankruptcy. 
But the executives who made those decisions, they weren't around long enough for Kodak to be destroyed. And so they got very, very rich making short-term decisions Mm -hmm. where had Kodak had been willing to take the short-term hit to reconfigure their company... And they had 10 years to do it. They didn't have to do it in one year. They could have done it really right, slowly. Right, they obviously had more warning than anybody they else. more warning. They had 10 years to perfect the technology and actually make a slow transition away or at least build up the digital side. For all we know, um, we would all be demanding Kodak technology in our, in our cell phones, you mm-hmm. know, that, that we wanted Kodak cameras in our cell phones. So uh, that's, that's what I mean by you have to have that infinite mindset. The infinite mindset is, is not about... Um, how can we make the most today? It's how can we stay in the game as long as possible? How is the infinite mindset different to just like long-term thinking? The problem with the term long-term thinking is what is long-term? Right. Right. And long-term, if you go back a bunch of years, you go back a few decades, companies would have 10 and 20 year plans. Now, when you talk to companies about quote unquote long-term thinking, we're talking like a five-year plan Mm. and most companies don't even have a five-year plan. And if they did have a five-year plan, they're probably not sticking to it. Um, because again, there's a lot of misaligned incentive structures. Um, and so infinite, we can all agree on, you know, uh, we, that we know what that is. Stay in business for as long as possible. Mm. And, and I'll give you a great, great, great example uh, um, of what happens because I talked about decline of innovation. And the problem with a finite mindset is you're always competing against someone. But as we've already established in an infinite game, there's no one to beat. Mm. The only one to outdo is yourself. Right? You should be competing against yourself. That's, that's truly the only competition. Now, there are other players in the game. You have to be aware of them. You have to know what they're doing. You can learn from them. Their strengths will reveal to you your weaknesses so that you can improve. But there's no such thing as beating them. Uh, like, and when, when companies do come up to me and say, well, you know, we are number one. I'm like, based on which metrics that you chose, right. based on which timeframes that you chose. And if somebody really does, like, no, no, Simon, we are number one. My answer is always the same. I always go, for now, <laughs> for now. Like, that's the whole infinite game. Like, nobody, sur- nobody stays in any position. It's always for now. So I'll give you a real-life example that I experienced that captured it so perfectly, the different mindsets. So this goes back a bunch of years. Um, I spoke at um, an education summit hosted by Microsoft. And a few months later, by sheer coincidence, I h- spoke at an education summit hosted by Apple. At the Microsoft summit, the vast majority of the executives spent the vast majority of their presentations, because I sat in the back of the room, talking about how they were going to beat Apple. At the Apple Summit, 100% of the executives spent 100% of their presentations talking about how they were going to help teachers teach and help students learn. So one was obsessed with their mission right. and how they could use their technology and their company to advance that mission. And the other one was obsessed with their competition and how they were going to use their technology to beat their competition. Right. You can start to see the finite and infinite yeah. mindsets already out of the out of the gate, but here's what happened. So at the end of my talk at Microsoft, they gave me a gift. I mean, it, you know, they gave me the new Zune when it was a thing. So this is back in the Steve Ballmer days, right? What was that? Zune. Zune. The Zune was Microsoft's response to the iPod. Oh, so it was like a music player. It was a music player. Yeah. I mean, I've that's never, how, I don't think I've even heard of exactly. it. Exactly. But that's important, right? <laughs> okay. And I got to tell you, this little piece of technology, because they were so obsessed with beating Apple that they, they got better and better at making the Zune because they wanted it to be better than an iPod. And I got to tell you, this thing was pretty good. Like this latest version of it was, was pretty impressive, mm-hmm. right? So I'm sitting in the back of a taxi with a senior Apple executive at the end of my, after my Apple talk. And typical Simon fashion, I couldn't help myself. I had to stir the pot. And so I turned to him and I go, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, they gave me their new Zune. And I got to tell you, it is so much better than your iPod Touch. And the guy leaned, looked over to me, he goes, I have no doubt. And the conversation was over. Because what he recognized when you have an infinite mindset is sometimes you have the better product mm-hmm. and sometimes they have the better product. And where Microsoft was trying to beat Apple, Apple was trying to outdo themselves. Right. Flash forward two or three years, Apple introduced the iPhone, rendering both the Zune and the iPod obsolete. So yeah, congratulations at Microsoft. You made a better iPod. Congratulations. Apple was already out of that game two or three years later. So that's what happens with an infinite mindset, which is your ability to innovate and advance. Because, when, you, because when, when you're competing against another player, the best you can ever do is one point higher than whatever they've done. Right. When you're playing with an infinite mindset, you invent new industries and new categories. Mm. And that's true innovation. It sounds like the idea of competitiveness itself mm. is only really in existence in a, 
within a finite mindset. No, no, no. You can compete against yourself. I see. My understanding of the term competition, like it thrives off some degree of scarcity, whether that's like real or artificial. Yeah. You know, you, you define some degree of, you know, when we design a game, we the designer is like trying to create constraints yeah. and rules and an environment, you know, the, the constraints which, which give it sort of shape out of which it arises. Yeah. So if I'm in an infinite game and I'm trying to cultivate this mindset within myself, mm -hmm. are there like certain rules or like habits that would be helpful to, to train yourself to yeah, compete so, against yourself? So, so I, there are, because there are other players in the game, it's important that we have different words to describe them in the different contexts. So in a finite game, those other players are your competitors. Right. Two teams against each other in a sporting event. Mm -hmm. One will be the victor, one will be the loser, and that is your competitor to be beaten. I have no issue with that, right? In an infinite game, we have rivals. Other players who are playing with us, and I believe, not I believe, I know, um, that some of those rivals are worthy of comparison. They are worthy rivals, mm. right? Where they do, they're playing at your level, or they're better than you. Mm -hmm. And they do some or many things better than you. And the advantage of knowing who your worthy rivals are is you can look at the things that they're doing better than you and you can say, ah, we need to improve there. And so your intention, the mindset is not to try and beat them, right? Because all, all you're trying to do is beat them. A, you can put lipstick on a pig. B, you can um, cheat the system for a short period of time to spike a metric. You know, you can, you can whatever it is, there's ways around that. But if the goal is, let's say that their um, their SEO is better than yours, right? Okay, that's a worthy rival. We can learn from them. Go study them. How do they do their SEO? Like, what factors have they learned? Let's get better at our SEO. And, and before you know it, your SEO starts to improve, you know? But you're competing against your shitty numbers, not against their good numbers. Right. And by the way, because you get to choose your own worthy rivals, they can come and go as you please. Like, you know, we, we'll do it in our organization. When we're, when we're shit at something or we know that there's room for improvement, we'll say to somebody on the team, go worthy rival this. We'll use it as a verb. Like, go find somebody who's just way better than us and learn from them and study them and see what we can beg, borrow, and steal so that we can be better ourselves. We're not trying to outdo them. We have no anger towards them. We're not, we don't have pictures of them with horns and, you know, Hitler mustaches. Any, you, know, we didn't, you know, we don't have that, you know? We just say, what can we learn from them so we can be better? And we wish them luck because we recognize that we can both succeed simultaneously. We're not trying to take anything from them. We're trying to get more for ourselves. We're trying to see how we can improve. Um, and so we're fiercely competitive with us. Have you always had this mindset yourself? Or is it sort of something you've had to train into yourself? You know, I've always been my own harshest critic, which you could argue is competing against yourself. Um, but no, I, I, I've had false senses of competition against others as well. Right. Did you, do, you, do you have a worthy rival? Yes, I have, I have many worthy rivals. But, but, uh, but before I knew they were worthy rivals, some of them were competitors. Right. Okay. There is one in particular that I'm thinking of. Um, and I've shared this story before, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it captures the point perfectly. There was another guy who does what I do. He, give, he writes books. He gives talks. Our careers would cross paths fairly, fairly often. We knew each other. He was always very nice to me. He never, he never did anything to hurt me. He never talked smack about me to anybody. He was pro very professional. And I absolutely hated him for no reason. I had contempt, right? And because of my fierce hatred, I was super competitive with him, right? So I would regularly log on to Amazon and I would check his book rankings and Oof. then I would check my book rankings. And if his book rankings were ahead, I would be angry. Mm. If my book rankings were ahead, I was smug, right? Um, keep in mind, I checked no one else's book rankings, just his, mm. right? So for all I know, we're competing for like, you know, 99th and 100th, you know? Like this is the problem with this obsession with competition. It's just very arbitrary. It's just arbitrary. He, for some reason, I picked him, you right. know, for no reason. Um, and I would look in places where my numbers were way better. Like maybe my numbers on social media were way better. And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. And I'd look in, and I'd avoid looking in places where his numbers were way better than mine, you know? Who knows where, what, what, what context. Anyway, we were invited to speak at the same conference. Um, and I don't mean him in the morning, me in the afternoon. I mean, like, we were going to be interviewed together on stage together. <laughs> and the uh, interviewer thought it would be fun if we in introduced each other. And so I went first. And 
as I'm about to introduce him, I sort of stopped. I looked at the audience. I looked at him and I said, you make me incredibly uncomfortable. I said, all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And whenever your name comes up, I get really insecure. And he looked at me and said, funny, I feel the same about you. The reason I was so competitive with him had nothing to do with him. It had to do with me. It's because when I knew, when I heard about his work, read his work, or other people invoked his work, all it did was remind me of the things that I'm bad at. Mm. And because it doesn't feel good to feel bad, it's much easier for me to direct that energy into a competitive spirit, into a, into a competitive mindset, mm. as opposed to saying, okay, Simon, why don't you work on those things or maybe partner with him so that your strengths and weaknesses are mitigated. Um, and I think that happens for a lot of people, which is... Which is it's like externalizing blame. Or externalizing something like blame, but it's, and it's easier. Yeah. Because why should I take responsibility for being crap at something? It's much easier to hate somebody and try and beat them and subvert them, you know, whenever possible. In poker, we have this saying, which is, when I win, it's because I played great. And it's when I, when I lose, it's because I got unlucky. Mm. And it's, it's so You can't true. have both. No, exactly. It's like, in this case, the bad guy is luck. Right. But it, it's just, our egos just love to yeah. take credit for our successes. And if there's any way to outsource blame, but you, you, don't, any, then, you don't learn from that. Look at any venture capitalist or any, <laughs> or any, you know, when they hit big, it's because they're geniuses. And when they lose, it's market conditions. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you can't have it both ways. It's you're either lucky and unlucky or you're a genius and an idiot. Like uh -huh. you've got to pick one logic. You can't pick, you can't mix your logics. And either one is fine, but you just got to pick one. Is it possible to weaponize an infinite mindset? An infinite mindset? Is it possible yeah. to weaponize an infinite mindset? Tell me more. What do you mean by weaponize? Use it against Use someone? Use it in a way, because it sounds like, and maybe I'm wrong, but my interpretation of, you know, if, if you're playing an infinite game, whether it's like something like business, you've described like relationships, friendships, these are all infinite games. Mm -hmm. I would ascribe all of those as good things, like things that are, the world benefits from. Actually, okay, so maybe the, the, the question I should ask prior to that is, are all infinite games good? Do they all benefit it the world? It depends whose side you're on, right? Like, I remember as a little kid, my grandfather was a navigator in the Royal Air Force in World War II, as were many grandfathers. <laughs> you know, they were involved in the war. And I, when I was a little kid, and I remember asking my grandfather a little kid question which was during the Second World War, who were the good guys and who were the bad guys? And my grandfather said, depends whose side you're on. Hmm. And remember, I'll give you a great analogy. Um, did you ever see the movie Inglorious Bastards? Yeah. So you, Christoph Waltz was astonishingly good. He played the Nazi. Right. Right? And when he was promoting the film, he went on Letterman. And Letterman asked him a question that he didn't understand the answer. He said, Letterman said, um, he doesn't understand the question. Letterman said, um, you played evil incarnate so effectively. What did you have to do as an actor to, to learn how to play evil so well? And Christoph Waltz looks at him and goes, what? And, and, and Letterman asks again, like, where as an actor did you have to go inside yourself to portray evil so effectively? And Christoph Waltz said, he wasn't evil. And what Christoph Waltz understood so clearly as an actor, which is nobody thinks they're evil. Right. Everybody thinks they're on the side of good. Yeah. So the way he played what we perceived as evil incarnate so effectively is he convinced himself that this guy had to desperately believe in the things he was doing and believe that he was on the side of good. And we saw that as, Ugh, right? Mm. And you talk to jihadis, you talk to any, everybody thinks they're on the side of good. Right, they all think they have a just cause. They all think they have a just cause. Yeah. And Dia Khan, who this amazing BAFTA and Emmy Award winning uh, documentarian who has spent time with white supremacists and jihadis and you know domestic terrorists and she's she gets out there she her work's incredible um she will tell you that she's never met anybody who's motivated by hate they're all motivated by love love of race love of god love it's all motivated by love um so everybody thinks they're on the side of good right and if you look at even our nation right now both sides think they're right both sides think they are mm. fighting the crusade for the for the, right. the, the, the preservation of our, our country and our democracy. Right. Everyone's trying to conserve something. That's, right. that's the funny thing. So everyone's trying to conserve something and everyone's trying to progress something. Right. It just, we happen to ascribe one more to the other, you know, one side than the other, but it's like, no, they're just trying to conserve different things and trying to progress different ideas. But, yeah. <laughs> and here's something that I struggle with and I find very uncomfortable and I've spent the better part of 10 years trying to prove myself wrong. And I can't. 
um, which is you need an enemy. And I struggle with that, right? Which is we are inherently dopamine driven animals. We're visually driven animals. Um, uh, just causes tend to be ethereal. They live in our imaginations, literally. I have a dream that is literally in your imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And it is inspiring and good. But until you can make tangible the thing that is standing in the way of your dream, it's, it's hard to mount a fight. It's hard to mount an effort because you don't know where to go or what to do. And so, and so even, in the, even, if, even if back in the Steve Jobs days, Apple was a consummate infinite player, they still were very smart at creating the enemy that was standing in their way. It was, um, first it was IBM. They wanted to beat IBM, right? And then it was Microsoft. Hi, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. They always made the comparisons of us and them, us and them, us and them. But isn't then that just finite? And this is, this is the complication. Y no, because they're not trying to beat the, they're not trying to beat the adversary per se. The adversary is standing in the way of the real thing that is driving them, which is the vision, the dream, the just cause, right? So take America and the Soviet Union. We weren't trying to beat the Soviet Union per se, right? Mm -hmm. But they were standing in the way of democracy and capitalism becoming the dominant philosophy of the world. I see. So their actual main optimization function was the, the you know, the, the mission, the ideology, right. the cause, whatever you want to call right. it. And enemy is just arguably more an obstacle. Or I would or argue existential threat. Sure. Right? So... Um, and we saw this take place, which is America made, America had the wrong mindset. So America made a horrible, horrible, I would argue it's the, the single greatest foreign policy blunder of the 20th century, which is when the Berlin Wall collapsed in 1989 and the Soviet Union collapsed two years later, mm -hmm. the United States declared publicly that we had won the Cold War. No, you didn't. It's just like when Circuit City went bankrupt, Best Buy didn't win anything, mm. right? Companies go bankrupt all the time and the other players in the field don't win anything. All that means is you have a little bit of a bump for now and eventually we all know new players will emerge. That's what always happens in an infinite mm. game. And so we stupidly believed that we had won a war that has no finish line, which is not what happened. It's like the Soviet Union as a political system went bankrupt. The people still exist. The cities, the cities still exist. You know, it's like it's all still there, right. you know? It's just like the empires that went bust, you know, the Ottomans or the, the Mayans, you know, the empires that went bust. The people are still there. The, the land is still there. And uh, it's the political structure that fell apart. And what ended up happening was America acted like a victor. We imposed our will in the world for about 11 years, un, unmatched. Um, uh, and though well-intentioned, it went a little haywire. Like we were trying to be the world policeman. And we did things like declare no-fly no zones over sovereign nations. If there was a balance of power, you just couldn't have happened. It's like wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, and what always happens in an infinite game is new, new competitors, new, I shouldn't say competitors, new rivals, new, new players will emerge. And if you consider the way the Cold War existed, right? Cold War 1.0 existed on, on three levels. There was, um, uh, there was existential, the two largest nuclear powers on the planet capable of completely destroying the earth multiple times over, the United States and the Soviet Union. There was a philosophical competition, right? American democracy and capitalism versus Soviet-style communism. Um, and all of our alliances were always on philosophical lines. If you were communist, we weren't friends with you. Mm. It was that easy. And the third one was uh, economic. The two largest economies in the world were the United States and the Soviet Union, right? Not coincidentally, those things overlap with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, um, and if you go back and look at the founding document of the Soviet Union, it'll talk about economic strength, military strength, and, and the advancement of the philosophy of communism. In other words, it seems that for a people to be motivated to strive and sacrifice for the greater good, it seems like you have to have this trifecta mm -hmm. of something life, something philosophical, and something economic, right? Would you say that the Soviet the three things? Yeah would qualify as like, because, uh, you know, in your book, you mentioned uh, you, the founding fathers, yep. their sort of core principles are very infinite minded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, for sure, for sure. For the sure. same with the Soviet? Absolutely. The Soviets were infinite minded. And, and it's best exemplified by the fact that they had a system for peaceful transfer of power. It wasn't a dictatorship. Mm. There were many, many, multiple secretaries general of 
of the Soviet Union, and they had a system for peaceful transfer of power. Granted, their secretaries general stayed in power for, you know, 20 years, but the point is when they weren't trying to install their children or their families, you know, it, it went from Lenin to Stalin to, you know, I, mean, I can't even remember all of them, you know, uh, and Dropov was in there, you know, uh, Chernenko, Gorbachev, right? Um, I actually think that was the list. Um, uh, I couldn't possibly um, know or correct. Yeah, I think it, I, <laughs> I might have so got bad. Andropov and Chernenko backwards. Chernenko didn't last very long. He was super quick. Yeah, I think it was Andropov, Chernenko. And anyway, it doesn't matter. Someone will correct this, oh, I'm sure. Oh, for sure. Someone in yeah. the comments is going to have it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the point is that they had a, 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 um, a system for peaceful transfer of power, which is important, as do monarchies. Monarchies have a system for peaceful transfer of power as well, right? Sometimes it gets a little complicated. So those systems, dictatorships are finite. Um, and this is why benevolent dictatorships are actually the best form of government, right? Super efficient. It's all benevolent. The problem with benevolent dictatorships is succession. They usually last but one person. <laughs> you know, they, there's like one, and then you're like, has, oh. there, be, has there been a, a real example of a benevolent dictator that you would say was, I mean, net good, you know, more than a democratic process? Singapore. Yeah. I guess. You know, Singapore is not really a democracy and it works really well. And Yeah. Do you think that's just a function of its size? I mean, that's a different conversation, yeah. whether, whether benevolent dictatorships right. can operate at scale. You know? I mean, and size is relative. Si relative to what? If this was 300 years ago, Singapore would be freaking sure. huge. So, And so I, if you look at what happened to America, right? We imposed our will on the world for about 11 years and then new players started to emerge that filled those three things. And those three things were all conveniently co-located in the Soviet Union. So they were, you know, enemy number one, public enemy number one. Super easy for us, tangibly. So those three things were replaced. So this, the, the, the nuclear weapon tension was replaced by North Korea, maybe Iran, right? Mm. The uh, philosophical tension, Soviet-style communism, was replaced for many years by religious extremism. As It was a philosophy looking for customers, right? And then the economic tension was largely replaced by China. And even though China um, is filling more and more of this, and some would argue that Russia was trying to get into all of them, right? Um, uh, and at least as of now, we don't fear nuclear war with China. It's not something we fear, right? We're not hiding in our desks for fear of being bummed by China like we feared nuclear war with, with the Soviets. But the point is, is that those three tensions that still exist and they're alive and well, the Cold War is alive and well. Hmm. It's just a different form of it. And the problem is, is now the the existential threat has been diffused because it's it's across multiple poles, po multiple nations. And so for the rest of the world, they see public threat number one as us because all three of those tensions exist in the United States. Mm. But we are so freaking blind and don't realize that there are very real existential threats outside our own borders that we're so preoccupied with ourselves. And it goes back to, you know, that we we look for enemies. So when the Soviet Union went away, then how do you know what you stand for if you can't see who's standing in your way, right? And when you per no longer perceive an existential, ex external existential threat, you start looking internally. Right. And this is why we're so divided as a nation yeah. is because we had the wrong mindset when the, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And, and so we look for, and by the way, this has been repeated throughout history. This is what happened to the Romans as well. You know, when the Romans external existential threat, which is Carthage, was flattened. They started looking internally and right. Roman Things Empire went into steep apart. decline due to infighting. I mean, so it's, a, it's I'm very uncomfortable with the fact yeah, that, we that need... you have to have an enemy, but uh, I can't find a case that, uh, that demonstrates our ability to come together and sacrifice willingly to advance a greater good without a tangible representation of someone standing in our way and pretty much the only thing in the world that gets people to come together and sacrifice for a long period of time and en masse is war. Mm. And I find that very upsetting. Well, this is why I'm yabbering on in almost every piece of content I make about this concept of this Moloch creature, Yeah. right? Because to me, that is the personification, manifestation of of this, these nebulous forces of like misaligned incentives that create war, yeah. that create dispute, rivalry in in, the, in unhealthy ways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this many times at length yeah. about like, what's the best way of framing this, this, these forces. Yeah. Um, but I think it is important to like give it a face and a name. Yeah, yeah. Make it tangible. Make it tangible. Like, we're tangible driven animals. Yeah. Like we need to see the thing, right? Now I will say, 
if you go back to the Cold War 1.0, it was, there was mutually assured destruction, right? So it was actually stable. Mm. So we have to distinguish between an enemy in the infinite realm versus an enemy in the finite realm. Mm. Because I would argue that if it, in the finite realm it's unstable, which is why it leads to war. And in the infinite realm, it's actually quite stable because we try to avoid the war. We actually, we don't want to go to war, mm -hmm. right? But there is definitely a tension that is managed. And I think that's a better way to think of comp how competition exists in an infinite game, which is it's a managed tension mm -hmm. rather, rather than de a desire to beat. Right, it's, it's a sort of voluntary destroy. tension. It's a voluntary tension. It, it has this and, layer of like consciousness to and it. And a necessary tension. Yes. Because it's much easier to know what you stand for when you can see what you stand against. So how would we, you know, again, if, if Moloch is this personification yeah. of... Mo Moloch is forcing us to maintain the Moloch trap. Yes. The Moloch trap is playing in the infinite game with the finite mindset. The Moloch trap for me is playing mm. to win in a game that has no finish line, trying right. to outdo, beat, destroy someone that you, they may go bankrupt, but the game isn't over. Right. And this what, is what's why- What's an example? Of, of a company in the Moloch trap? Yeah. Well, I think it's most companies, you know, it's the way most companies do business with. They're so obsessed with beating their competition that they can actually do things to harm themselves. Or, so like optimizing for a short-term metric. Because well, that's I mean, actually how most businesses do, a, a, right? They're an, like, an obsession with efficiency. Yeah. Right? Like I remember talking to a CFO of a very significant company once. Uh, and significant, I mean by size. Um, and I said, what are your priorities? He said, innovation and efficiency. And I said, good luck with that. You know, in, innovation is inherently wasteful. Go ask 3M. Go ask mm. some of the most innovative yeah, companies like in the world. they're like diametrically opposed they're, almost. They're, I mean, there is experimentation, which is inherently wasteful. And so when a company is obsessed with um, margin and cost and efficiency, you literally are engineering out innovation mm. because you're not allowing a space for people to try and fail um, or allow a space for people to say something that's completely badass stupid and for somebody to go, wait, wait, no, hold on, hold on. There's something in there. You know, Everybody's going to take the safe road or ignore the, 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 big, the big risks that they could try and take. Nothing yes. wrong with the focus on efficiency, as long as it's not efficiency at, at any cost. Right. And this was the big mistake that, um, that Americans made when we brought the Toyota way to the United States. You know, the Harvard professors that went to Japan and studied Toyota and thought, oh my God, this Toyota way is so incredible. Look what Toyota is like the most incredible company in the world. How do we bring this to America? And we called it lean. Mm -hmm. And you're like, guys, it was never about efficiency. It was about constant improvement. And the whole point of the Toyota way was to allow the front line to make micro, micro corrections and suggestions to the process that over the course of uh, time become monumentally large. Right. Whereas when we do lean, we like send in a bunch of consultants to like evaluate the factory and almost leave out uh, the front line mm. who know more about what's going on than anybody else. Um, so in our, you know, Americans screwed it up and we screwed up the Toyota way when we brought it when we brought it domestic. And the number of companies that will say that lean did more damage to their companies because they became obsessed with efficiency. Um, I think another Moloch trap, I fell into the Moloch trap, right? Being obsessed with beating my, right. my arch rival, dun, 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 you know, when there was no real game at play. There was no game. The game was a complete artificial narrative in my head. That, I think, is a part of the Moloch trap, which is perceiving a game to be one where there is actually no game. Right. Not only is there no competition, there's actually no game. So it's like this idea of false zero-sumness. False zero-sumness, right. It's seeing a fixed pie when there isn't one. And, and remember, there's no fixed rules, there's no agreed-upon objectives, and there's no agreed-upon timeframes. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally inventing a game that doesn't exist. And my sense of winning or losing depends on where I'm looking. One it's thing, all my emotions. No actual game at play. Right. So that's a Moloch trap. Or the, we've, all, we've all been in this situation where we hear that somebody we work with gets a promotion and, and we get angry. Like, we got angry at somebody else's career success. Like, what nerve is that pushing against? Well, they don't deserve it. Mm. They didn't earn it. I'm smarter. I'm like, whatever, whatever narrative 
Somebody, there's some, that's an emotional reaction to somebody else's success. What are you worried about their career for? Why didn't you worry about your own? That's a Moloch trap. Obsessive focus on what other people are doing over what you're doing. Right. Again, and, it's optimizing, over-optimizing for one narrow metric. And, and something happened when COVID hit that I found magical and reinforced all of the things that you and I are trying to share with, with people, which is when we went into lockdown and COVID happened, not a single company was obsessing about what their competition was doing. Mm. 100% of companies were obsessing with how to stay alive, survival. That was the only thing, right? You literally didn't care what the marketing plan, what the new product was. You didn't, no one cared what their competition was doing. It, overnight, we just stopped caring about the competitors and we're obsessed with survival of ourselves. And that is the correct mindset in harsh times and good right. times. So it's almost like that mind, the, this excessively competitive mindset is a luxury belief. Correct. And so if you look at any time war strikes, or more importantly, when there's an existential threat, right? The stupid stuff or for, falls, yeah, away, falls away. Right? September 11th. Like all the stupid stuff just fell away. We actually became much more focused on important stuff. Mm. You know, World War II, the Blitz. I mean, people were way more focused on what was actually important and actually helped move the needle for survival. And, and look at the quality of innovation. Like the, the number of things that were invented in World War II, like is like radar, the microwave. Mm. I mean, I only know a short list. I mean, it's just like this huge long list of innovation that happened in the 40s and then perfected in the 50s for some of them is astonishing because we weren't worried about stupid stuff. We had to like, we had to solve problems and we had to solve them quickly. We built the Pentagon. We built the whole Pentagon in something like four years, you know, or maybe even less. And it came in on time and on budget. Um, I think it was actually less than four years. We'd have to look it up. But it was, if you had to build the Pentagon today, like 20 years later, they'd still be putting the finishing touches on it. We saw it happen in the 80s. Like we had the hole in the ozone and it became really critical and we all be, were afraid of the hole in the ozone and we fixed it. Right. We that's, full that's actually one of the best examples of us getting out of a Moloch trap. We, we full have, on fixed it. It was a deep coordination yeah. problem. There were massive incentives for everyone to defect. But it was driven by, but remember, thing. fear Fear came with it. Right. Fear came with it, right? And the, 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 there's been the, the scientists, don't let scientists and engineers do marketing. No, they're, they're terrible. And the scientists have been like, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to humanity. And we're going to see the results. I think maybe, I can't tell you exactly, in about 50 years, but I, it's so bad. Like, made no one afraid, hmm. right? That's like telling a 21-year-old, <laughs> you know, you know, when you retire, when you're 60, you're not going to have any money in the bank. You should probably start saving now. Yeah, see how well that goes. Like, human beings just aren't that smart and we're not that good at, like, imagination and forward planning. And that goes back, I love all the repeating patterns that we've had in here, the repeating themes, which is when imagination is not enough. Hmm. Tangibility has to be enough. Tangibility is what we can point to, you know? Um, and some of, and I, even though I know there's confusion between weather and climate, some of the extreme weather at least is making tangible. And that is screwing with people's lives and livelihoods, you know? And it's making difficult, um, life difficult. Like at least that's a detail we can point to saying, see, we have to stop that. And the point is, is like the pressure of existential threat is kind of amazing. Now, we couldn't operate under those conditions all the time. Right, because the trouble is, is that it then cannibalizes. Well, A, we become numb to it, but it also cannibalizes a bunch of resources yeah. into, you know, World War II. Yes, it created a bunch of brand new, amazing technologies. It also created a bunch of really shitty ones. You know, yeah. we got the nuclear bomb out of it, um, among well, other things. I mean, the and application is awful. The science is incredible. Yes. It's almost just like we need a reality check every now and then. That's the value of an existential threat. I think so. It's, you know, it's like if aliens suddenly showed yeah, up, yeah. you know, Independence Day style, or hovering over every yeah, city, yeah. you'd yeah. like to think that we would stop bickering over like gender disagreements well, or whatever. Well, you know, we would, the culture war stuff would fade away temporarily. We, we saw it. I mean, part of Osama bin Laden's plan on September 11th is that he would attack us and he would divide our nation. Mm. And the total opposite happened. Right. Which is no matter how much people hated George Bush, everyone rallied around the president. Mm. You know, we became a very unified nation because the external threat was vastly greater <sighs> than any internal threat and in daily politics. Do you think that's even possible today? I was just wondering, like, is there anything that could come along now to would make... <laughs> People stop fighting on Twitter for a little while. I mean, while. the thing that I the thing that I find upsetting is 
our incredible ability to politicize everything. Right. And my hope was that COVID was going to be that thing. And if anything, it, it made it worse. If anything, it made it worse. And, um, you know, you have to consider the precariousness of a nation when both sides of a political system are accusing the other side of being traitors or unpatriotic or un-American. Right. When the reality of a political system is simply we agree on the cause, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We agree in the structure, the constitution. We disagree about how best the way to, get to implement and advance it. And that should be a political debate. And it should go in and out of fashion. Like sometimes one theory is suits the times and the economic times, uh, you know, better and the culture and the politics and the, you know, the technology of the day. And, 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 and that pendulum should have a healthy swing. Um, but uh, when, when both sides accuse the other of destruction, when both sides believe they're on the side of uh, construction, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's bad. Is there any low-hanging fruit that you think, okay, if we could just, you know, if you could click your fingers and yeah. do tomorrow to try and fix this, you know, this, the, the U.S. is essentially its ideological civil war that it's yeah. got going on. Yeah. Is there anything that you think should be happening right now? That so, isn't? so an existential threat certainly is a jolt, um, but the reality of anyone um, threatening the homeland is pretty small. Mm. And wars in foreign lands... Uh, they don't threaten us in the way that World War II threatened us and the way Hitler threatened us. Like, you know, I think Europe is coming together in a magical way because Russia, mm -hmm. Ukraine is on their back, you know, is on their, in their, on their doorstep. And so, you know, the bickering of Europe seems to have subdued some. And one of the unintended byproducts of, you know, again, miscalculation, understanding finite and infinite games, which is uh, Putin thought that he would fracture uh, NATO and Europe, and the opposite is happening. Right, he's, definitely. He's he the, he's he's done a very good job of strengthen, strengthening it because he represented an existential threat to all of them, mm. and so all of their stupid bickering and silliness, as we've been discussing, just instantly vanishes. Yeah, the trouble is, is that I don't think we can. You know, we we can't hope for you know, war can't be the answer like no 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 no. no 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 uh, and, and no I, I know do, you're I, not saying that and, but. and i do believe i do believe that war happens when we start to adopt when we when we fall into a moloch trap mm. I, I think you're right about that which is war happens when one one party doesn't require both but one party falls into the moloch trap because if you can stay out of the moloch trap you then you manage attention mm. you can st I, 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 my the discomfort that i have is there has to be an enemy and that makes me really uncomfortable. Which is Moloch. Well, Moloch is is a is a story, like Moloch is a, is, a, is a metaphor, and and so even in my work, right? When I talk about my work, and I'm super sort of in the clouds, and I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. And I talk about the world and business in these ideological terms you know, infinite, 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 and beautiful, lovely, mushy, mushy, mushy. But I'm also fully aware that I say things like, I want to undo everything Jack Welch did. Jack Welch is my, he is my Moloch. He is standing in the way of my vision. He is, he is, he is forcing people to play his game as opposed to playing the ideological right game that's good for all and win-win. Moloch is forcing people to play win-lose. Jack Welch is forcing to play, you know, and then I and then I have modern ones like, you know. Tell us who tell us who Jack Welch is. Uh, Jack Welch was the CEO of General Electric in the uh, 80s and 90s, and he became the poster child for a new way of um, um, interpreting capitalism. Things that we consider normal in business today are actually very modern constructions. So, for example, um, the obsession with quarterly results like mm. that didn't. That's that's relatively new. Jack Welch helped popularize that. The use of equity, uh, the stock price, mm. to incentivize um, professional um, executives um, didn't exist. Uh, to the right, that was like a Milton Friedman thing, yeah. right? So Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman in the, in the late 1970s, um, he wrote it multiple places, but it was really this one op-ed that he wrote in the New York Times where he, he basically offered a new definition of business, um, sort of counter to Adam Smith, who was sort of the, the grandfather of modern capitalism. And... Uh, just as an aside, it's Adam Smith's version of capitalism 
that Thomas Jefferson was obsessed with and had written, had read all the volumes of Wealth of Nations. And it was Madam Smith's version of capitalism that made America great um, and made America what it is today. But then in the 1970s, um, Milton Friedman theorized that the purpose of business, this is how he did, the purpose of business, right, is to uh, maximize profit within the bounds of the, the law, right? He never talked about ethics or advancing a cause or looking after people, just to maximize profit. <laughs> And one single metric. There you go. That's distilling the whole that's richness it. and complexity of all forms uh, of business down to one correct. single thing. Uh, yeah, and then you hear this nonsense, you know, about I have a fiduciary duty to maximize profit. Right. I'm like, hmm, no, that's it's one of code. that's one. That's one of them, right? Um, and so what happened was uh, there was a class of executive at the time who embraced Friedman and used Friedman's thinking to change the way in which we articulated, not articulated, interpreted capitalism. And so I'm a diehard capitalist. I do not like this version of capitalism that we're living in now. Which, um, is this like what late stage capitalism is? Uh, kind it's of, very, or? very short termist, right? right? We even talked about before that long term plans, like we think five years is long term, <laughs> and even those don't happen, right? The obsession with quarterly results, the, the, the obsession with finite, uh, I believe that capitalism as a philosophy fell into the Moloch trap. Yep. And the concept of using mass layoffs to balance the books, where we use people's livelihoods on an annualized basis so that we can meet an arbitrary projection, right? Think about that for a second. We're profitable, just not as profitable as we promised Wall Street, so you have to lose your job. Jeez. That, that as, a, as a strategy, did not exist in the United States I mean, it's like a pri prior to the 1980s. It wasn't a thing. Yeah. Layoffs were used really existentially, like our company is dying and we have to take drastic measures. Right, but as a just an annual strategy, an annual tactic to to meet uh, projections, literally didn't exist. That is a Moloch trap. Mm -hmm. um, pitting executives against each other is a Moloch trap, which is now normalized. Um, I mean, we now live in a system where an executive goes on television, and if they announce that we are um, having layoffs, the stock price goes up, and if they announce that we're investing in R and D, the stock price goes down. Like. You think, so about, you think about the infiniteness of companies and business and what it takes to survive for the long term, that's the opposite. Yeah. Layoffs destroy cultures and R&D ensures that you're going to reinvent yourselves for the future. Um, so, the, so Jack Welch really, what he did at GE and the engineering at GE became the poster child for this new modern form of capitalism, this Milton Friedman form of capitalism. And Jack Welch, I mean, in the short term and when you know, GE was the hero, well, GE is a shadow of its former self and may not even survive, at least not in, in its current form. You know, it might be chopped up and sold off for spare parts because it wasn't built to survive. It wasn't built to last. It was built for short-term gains mm -hmm. that enriched the lives of a few. Um, and the depressing part is, you know, we talk about private companies are better than public companies because you don't have the public pressures, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at the number of companies that are now VC or PE backed, it's something like 80%. I mean, it's a disgrace disgustingly high number. Right, and and they're, they're also playing a finite correct. game because they only, you know, VC fund or private equity fund only makes money when they sell. Correct. So, for the, so they're for, not, always incentivized to do the short-term so, thing. So their business model, their business model, like, you know, and I've heard so many horror stories, and that's not to say all VCs and PEs are horrible, but it seems like it's a disproportionately high number who, no matter what they say at the beginning of the relationship, give it a few years and the pressure they start exerting on the CEOs and the companies to make decisions that benefit their business model, not the company's business model, right? So in other words, being a private company with heavy VC or PE backing, you're going to face the same pressures right. that any public CEO faces from Wall Street, which is they're going to force you. Think about that. A public company is going to make decisions, right? They're going to make decisions about their company to help a 27-year-old analyst get their bonus. I mean, that's basically what's happening. Mm -hmm. And the same thing's happening in, 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 in private companies now. And so you asked before, like, what's it going to take short of, short of an, you know, a, a true existential crisis? And the answer is it took us 20 or 30 years, you know, slow boiling frog to get to where we are today. It's going to take 20, 30 years to undo it. And what it requires is better leadership and leaders who have a different definition of the purpose of business. And I would argue the purpose of business is to advance a cause, protect people, and maximize profit. In that order, advance a cause, cause, protect people, make profit, right? right? In that order. So profit, of course, has to be there, yeah. right? But it's, there's other the things as well. Thing, yes. And there's other things that sometimes are more important because when you make an ethical decision, an ethical decision is the choice to prioritize cause and people over money. Mm. Most unethical decisions that are made in business 
are prioritizing money over cause or people. That's roughly the, tr- the triple bottom line, right? Mo- model, what you just described? I mean, the way that most people do triple bottom line is, I think they do environment, people, and, and, uh, okay. and, and P&L. But it, you know, it's an attempt to, again, try and like, broaden the number of metrics that you're optimizing for and also reorder them. What's very important is the order. Right. Because, for example, I've never met a CEO who doesn't believe their people are important. Mm. They all think they're important. The question is where on the list. Right. You know, number one priority, growth. <laughs> Number two, shareholder value. Yeah. Number three, our customer. Number four, our people. See, we care about our people. They're yeah. there on the list. <laughs> Wrong order, right? <laughs> Trade-offs exist. Right? Yeah. So, um, the, and the reason, the reason the order matters is because um, it's a hierarchy, right? Um, and what it says is, when push comes to shove, I'm going to prioritize this over that. It isn't a company that, let's say, you know, the, the CEO and the executives, they all understand this. They want to switch more to changing the order of priority. How do they not... They're going to essentially take a, a short-term hit for long-term gain, but Correct. isn't the danger that then during that short-term hit... They get they, fired? Well, either they mm-hmm. get fired, but yeah, basically, the, again, the Moloch trap situation arises yeah. where... Correct. Well, we want to do the more ethical thing, but we can't because the guy down the road, the other... Well, other... that's different. That's a different thing. That's ethical fading, okay. right? So there is a concept in psychology called ethical fading, which I find uniquely fascinating, which is... Um, when good people are able to do highly unethical things, believing that they are still within their own ethical framework. And there are multiple things that contribute to the existence of ethical fading. Um, And one of those is um, euphemisms. So it goes back back before to the worthy rivals, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, it's much easier for me to direct my feelings of insecurity against someone else, right? So it's much easier for me to change the language of the things that I talk about so I don't have to feel like I'm taking responsibility. So for example, um, we constantly are talking about externalities, but we rarely talk about the damage we're doing to the people and environments in which we have our factories and offices. Mm. We don't speak in plain language, right? Because the word externalities is something that can be managed on a piece of paper, but we're not talking about the actual impact. You know, the United States would never, ever torture. It's against our values. But enhanced interrogation is very interesting. Right. Like, no company would ever, ever spy on its customers. But data mining, yeah, that's a very important data, modern business technique. You know, so we use language to separate um, our decisions and actions from the impact of those decisions and actions. That's one of the, 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 the things that starts to lean you into ethical fading as opposed to just having plain conversations about plain, in plain language. Mm. Um, another one is our ability to rationalize, right? Everyone's doing it. I, I, ha- I have no choice. If I don't do it, my, comp- my competitors will do it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's what my boss wants me to do. It's what I have to do to get ahead. I got to put food on the table. Don't hate the players, hate the game. Don't hate the players, hate the game. My personal favorite, it's the system, right? Which is a variation on the theme. Um, and again, what we're doing is we're able to disconnect ourselves from the impact of the things that are happening. Just following orders. That was a famous one, the Nuremberg defense. Just mm-hmm. following orders, right? Um, not my fault, not my fault. Not my fault, just following orders, you know? Um, and so if you have enough of these things that happen, eventually you have full-blown ethical fading where you can have an entire culture inside a company capable of doing highly unethical things um, and there are no checks and balances left until there's a scandal or you know, law, government intervenes. The amazing thing is, is when these things happen, when these scandals blow up, you know, we drag the executives in front of Congress for, for testimony, and they almost all say the same thing. We broke no laws. Like, so take, for example, um, a drug company that might own uh, a patent on an essential drug. Um, and this happened with the, uh, the EpiPen, right? Mm. The company that owned the patent on the, on the EpiPen which had like a 90 something percent market share. So I mean like you're the only game in town. And by the way, you have to throw it away every year. It only has a shelf life of of one year, right? So even if you don't use it, you you gotta buy a new one. Mm. Great business model, right? Um, Literally because the board is like, you need to hit these numbers and the company's like, all right, we gotta hit those numbers. Um, What they started doing is jacking up the price, 300%, 500%, 600%, 800%. They raised it like 1500% or something ridiculous within a very short period of time within like two years. Now there are people who need an EpiPen to survive. They, can't, they can no longer afford the EpiPen. And these guys are celebrating because they're hitting their numbers. 
Now, there's nothing illegal about what they did. Right. And when they're dragged in front of Congress, um, and I believe the CEO at the time, her dad was a congressman, aside. But anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, when they dragged them in front of Congress to testify, they all say the same thing. We broke no laws. We worked the highest standards of the law. Yeah, but what about ethics? Right. That is clearly unethical. And good companies that prioritize cause people and then profit would never make those decisions. Mm. When you pray, you know, that's that's where 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 uh, Miltonian Jack Welchian capitalism goes completely haywire, which is we literally make decisions that will destroy our own companies and our own economy. In 2008, that was all Moloch trap produced. Yeah, you know, uh, dot com bubble, all Moloch trap produced. Mm. And I mean, it looks like we're trending back into it again. Yeah, of course. The the dismantling of Glass Steagall. Yeah. All Moloch Trap produced. Moloch Trap. Uh, Glass Steagall was the act that was passed shortly after the Great Depression to prevent another great stock market crash from happening ever again. And it ran until the seventies, right? Um, they started to dismantle it. It still exists in some shadowy form, but it's largely been dismantled during the eighties and nineties. And which, by the way, during Republican and Democrat administrations. So don't point to each other. You both did it. Do you know the total number of um, significant stock market crashes we had between? Glass Steagall and the dismantling of it? Nope. The answer is zero. We had zero. Do you know how many we've had since the dismantling? We had three. We had uh, Black Monday, we had uh, dot com, and we had 2008. Hmm. Um, all Moloch traps because they, we, we removed all the checks and balances. I mean, one of the checks and balances, for example, is that investment uh, a bank couldn't be a retail bank and an investment bank in the same organization. That was illegal after Glass Steagall. Turns out, seems the most reasonable thing. Seems pretty basic, <laughs> you know. It, it curbed, you know, speculation and all kinds of things. Anyway, the point is, you are absolutely right. This Moloch trap is, unfortunately, the Moloch trap. Uh, our our form, American modern American capitalism, and the executives that are overseeing it. Unfortunately, the majority of them are all sitting in a deep pit of Moloch trap. Like if the Moloch trap was like a big hole in the ground with some leaves over the top, they all fell in. Right, yeah. You know? And so you ask me, what is it going to take to get out of it? It's going to take some really forward thinking, really courageous young leaders. And I say young because I think some of the older leaders, even though they know that the system is broken, they're either too far deep or their their incentive structures are so misaligned that they would have to completely destroy their careers to affect it. And some of them do have that courage, don't get me wrong. But a, a new breed of a young entrepreneur who are, who are building companies from the ground up. Mm. And, you know, the Brian Cheskies of Airbnb, the, the, the guys over at um, Sweetgreen, you know, uh, Yves Chenault, what he built, he's older, but what he built at Patagonia. Like these companies are talking differently. They're sounding differently than Jack right. Welch. And, and it's going to, like I said, they're experimenting with infinite mindedness. They're experimenting with um, cause and people before profit. So I, I can imagine the pushback some people are probably feeling hearing this. And because I, I know it, you know, I went through this phase myself, but it was particularly sort of during COVID that it felt like it became the thing for companies to start sort of signaling about how ethical they are, yeah. you know, essentially virtue signaling. Yeah. Um, and I use that term in like the, the more like disparaging way and the, yep. you know, they're, it, it's like empty. Yep. They're latching on to, oh no, this is, this is a, the current thing and we look how yep. conscious we are. And how do we, I guess, discern between the companies that are truly authentically having this excellent cause in mind, um, you know, from the outset and it's an infinite cause yep. versus the ones that are kind of like jumping on the bandwagon yep. of, of signaling, signaling yeah. virtue. So, so what we call virtual signaling, the, the technical term for virtue signaling is marketing, <laughs> 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 you know? Um, and like the number of companies that have a purpose statement on their website, but if you go look at the decisions that they make, it seems like they've never read that purpose statement, you mm -hmm. know? Because clearly they're not following it. You know, they're not following the cause that they seem to have laid out um and unfortunately whether we like it or not that is the only way to find out which is right. to compare um the decisions they make think of it like in a personal relationship you know your partner can say anything they want to you about how good they are and how they mean well well i believe you i'll give you the benefit of the doubt but then i'm going to watch right and if i I, I don't expect aligned. you get it all right but if i can see you're like you're really trying to get it right okay <laughs> I, I think this is for real, but I, if I see that you've really never even like paid any attention and you just said those things to get me off your back, 
uh, it was marketing. Mm. He is just selling. And uh, um, this is why, I, you know, I think B Corp and, and organizations like B Corp who have very, very strict rules um, and they will uh, rate a company that they are, it helps us make decisions because the average person neither has the resources, time, or quite frankly, desire to go do a deep dive research, you know, on, on a company, what they say and what they do. And so we do need third party um, uh, to help us. And even that gets tricky because who's an authoritative and ethical and legitimate third party, you know? Um, because, you know, many, many companies say endorsed by this organization that they fund, you know? But B Corp, I think, is one of those that when you see a B Corp sign, you can take comfort that that's a company that's really trying to do the right thing and, and is already operating at higher standards than most. So bring it back down to a more personal level mm. for people watching. You wrote a book called, first of all, it was, uh, you wrote Start With Why. Yep. And then you wrote Finding Your Why. How do we go about finding our why? Like, is it possible to take the viewers through the exercise? The simple answer is yes. I mean, there are many, many ways to do it. Uh, and it's really boils down to personal preference. Um, you know, I got so many complaints after I wrote Start With Why, like, got it, how do I do it? So eight years later, I wrote Find Your Why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, better late than never. Um, so Find Your Why is a workbook that people can buy on Amazon and go through the process of finding your why. And you can do that. On our website, we have all kinds of resources, self-guided, or we can guide you to find your why. That's another resource that we make available. Um, but I can tell you another fun way, which is totally free, called the friends exercise. Find a friend, a very like a best friend, who you love and they love you. They'd be there at 3 o'clock in the morning for you. If you needed them, you'd be there for them at 3 o'clock in the morning if they needed you. Um, do not do this with a spouse. Do not do this with a member of your family, a sibling, those relationships too are too close, yeah. Mm. Do it with a best friend. And ask them this very simple question. Why are we friends? And they're going to look at you like you're nuts. Because the part of the brain that controls our feelings, like friendship and trust and loyalty, the limbic brain, doesn't control language, which is our neocortex. And so this is why we struggle to put our feelings into words. It's why we use metaphors and analogies all the time, because we struggle to put our feelings into words, right? It's like this. It's like, I feel like I'm on a train that's heading towards the end of the track. It's like, got it. Um, so you ask them this question, and they're going to look at you like you're crazy because they don't have the words to describe why they love you. So you actually stop asking the question, why? And you say, come on, come on. What specifically is it about me that I know that you'd be there for me no matter what? Because when you ask the question, why, you get an emotional response. Mm. So now we want them to engage their rational brains. So we ask the question, what? Okay, what specifically is it about me that I know you'd be there for me no matter what? And they're going to hem and haw and they're going to struggle and they're going to start describing you. I don't know. You're smart. You know, I trust you. You're loyal. You're always there for me. And you have to play devil's advocate. Great. That's the definition of a friend. You have that with many people. What, specific is, what specifically is it about me that I know you'd be there for me no matter what? And again, they're going to hem and haw. Don't help them. Don't let anybody else help them. It's a torturous experience, but you have to go through it. And eventually, they'll give up. Eventually, they'll give up and say, I don't know. All I know is, and they'll start describing themselves. All I know is, and this is what my friend said to me, all I know is, Simon, I can sit in a room with you. I don't even have to talk to you and I feel inspired. And I got goosebumps. In fact, I'm getting them right now, right? Every time I tell this story, I get the goosebumps. Because basically what they did is they articulated the value you have in their life mm. and you had the emotional response. So you either got goosebumps or you well up with tears or something touches you because it mattered so much to you. And if you do this with multiple friends, they will say very similar, if not the exact same thing, because your why is the thing you put out and give to the world, right. and it's the reason people love you and value you. So the space that you fill in people's lives is the thing That's that you give them, is your why. So it, it will definitely get you in the right ballpark. You may not get the exact words, but you'll definitely get something that's useful and actionable. And it's a fun, it, and it's just generally a fun process. We did this exercise a few days ago. Yeah. Um, we recorded your podcast and I ended up crying. You did. <laughs> which has never happened before. Right. But this is the it's, power of the why. When you, yeah. you're, you're going deep into the part of the brain that... Because it's hard to actually find. It's like, I just I want the world to keep existing and things to yeah. be good and people have a nice time. But it's like, and it's just so deeply personal, but... Yeah, your, your, your it's, why... It's touching on a truth. Your why is the preservation of relationships. I, and, I, and I, the word preserve is probably too, too passive for you. 
Mm. Um, but it's sort of like the fierce protection or, you know, like, and you can see all of your work, the times where you've sort of talked about yourself falling in a Moloch trap was not a good time in your life. You talk mm. about how it became insidious and self-destructive. You know, you talk about, you know, when you talk privately about, you know, your family, um, it, it's the, it's, it's, you, you become deeply protective of relationships. Um, when you talk about the things that you love in your career or your, you know, the, the great memories in your life is when people came together in great joy to solve problems, you know, and for you, this, there's this beautiful relationship theme that, that exists throughout. And ultimately what win-win is, is the preservation of a relationship. That's all it is, mm -hmm. is like, we hope to do business together. And so if I negotiate with the intention that you feel like you're winning and you negotiate with the intention that I feel like I'm winning, not only will we both get everything we want, but my goodness, what a great way to start a business relationship, mm -hmm. you know? And your, your, your uh, hope is that that should be the standard operating, uh, mode of operating for um, personal relationships, business relationships, and that's what you call win-win. And the Moloch trap is the thing that is preventing those things from happening. Mm. Tangent, <laughs> different topic. <laughs> My favorite kind. You are, you know, we've we've been at a number of conf conferences actually over the last year. Um, weirdly, weirdly, we, right? Yeah, um, like all of them. Yeah, and yeah. every time I see you speak, yeah, every single time, you just blow me away. You are truly one of the best speakers I think alive. Thank you. How the hell do you do it? <laughs> like, what's your secret ingredient? Like, what, what, like your process? Like, yeah. you know, as someone who's trying to become a better speaker, yeah, I just yeah. like, I'm sitting there watching your stuff and I'm trying to like imbibe and ingest yeah, it. And yeah. I bet there's a lot of people out there who also are trying to, you know, you know, most people have fear of public speaking and want to be, you know, the best version, of, you know, best speaker they can be. So yeah. give us your wisdom. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, so there's a few things. Um, one is um, I don't really want to be a public speaker. And so I don't have, um, I don't have the need at, a, at an emotional level um, uh, to be liked in that space because it's not my chosen profession. What I have is a deep-seated drive to spread a message that I desperately believe in. Mm. And it just so happens that speaking publicly is a, is a good way to do it. And so like when I have people come up to me and say, oh, I really want to be a public speaker. Can you give me some advice how I can have that as a career? And I go, sure, absolutely, happy to help. What do you want to speak about? They go, I don't know yet. Oh. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you're, you're missing it. You have to have something that you have desperate belief in. Then you figure out the way to do it. And speaking is maybe a good way. Um, but you can't, think I want to be a speaker and have nothing to speak about. Like that's, that's when you care too much about what people think about you and, and because that's now your career, right? Right. Um, for me, that was just a, a path, a strategy. So again, it's actually about finding your why first. It's about finding your why first. Yeah. yeah you have you to find have, your why. And then it happens to be that speaking is yeah, one of the mediums correct. through which you can transmit it. Correct. And because that was my standard, like I never got bothered like by the size of my audience. Right. Mm. So for example, I remember I, in the early days, people would say, we promise you an audience of a hundred people. And I'd show up to the event and they had 26 and they were like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I'd be like, no, no, don't worry about it. That's, you know, 74 people that are going to miss out. Like, mm. and I would give a hundred percent of my energy to those 26 people. Um, cause I wasn't there for the numbers. I was there for the message and whoever wanted to show up. Um, I never cared if people were on their phones while I was speaking, because if I'm that boring, then yeah, you you should play Wordle, like, <laughs> like, because my job, if I'm good at my job, my job is to hold your attention. Like that is my job to give you something that makes you want to put your phone down and be like, this is interesting. That's my job. So if I'm bad at my job, yeah, you should go do something. And I don't know what you're typing on your phone. Maybe you're tweeting. This is amazing. Maybe you're helping me spread my message. You, I said something in a Thank you in notes. A, maybe I said something in, in soundbite form that you're putting on all your social because you want to spread it. Maybe you're taking notes. Like I don't know mm. why. I'm not going to take. I heard so many speakers. They would stand up and go, "Ladies and gentlemen, can you just put your phones away for an hour? Show me some courtesy while I speak." I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. That's not how it works." So, 
So number one is intention. Like you have to show up with something you believe in desperately and you believe that it's really important for this message to be spread and you are going to learn the facility of public speaking so that other people can in, can fall in love with this idea as much as you have fallen in love with it. Mm. That is the reason to perfect the skill set, right? I want you to see how beautiful this thing is like I see how beautiful this thing is. Um, I never show up to take. I always show up to give. And you can always tell the difference in public speakers, right? So I will literally, before I go out on stage, I will mutter under my breath out loud to myself, you're here to give. Every time mm. you're here to give. Because it changes my mindset for I'm up there, right? Because when you're here to give, you'll answer every question. You'll you show up with full energy. You you. It doesn't matter if they like you or not. Like, I'm here to give. When you're here to take, you can always tell. Mm. You care too much if you get a standing ovation. Um, you, you expect the, something. You expect something back. Um, when people ask you questions, you give answers like, well, you can find that in my new book. you know, Or like the slide behind you has like all your socials you know, because you, want, you showed up for followers. Mm. You showed up for business. You showed up to take. You showed up to get you know, um, as opposed to showing up to give. Um, you start by telling people your credentials. That's my favorite one. You know, um, I, whenever I speak, I start, I just, people always make fun of me because there's no, I just, like I stand in the middle of the stage, I give it a beat and I just start like, here's a story. Bang. I don't be like, thanks for having me. This is an honor. Right. I'd like to thank the host. You know, if there's you, no preamble, I've, I've written all these books and I've done all these Ted talks. I don't tell you anything about me because it's not about me. Never was about me. I'm just a vessel for a message. That's all I am. Mm. And so, you know, there's, I mean, I can tell you all the tricks that I've learned that can make somebody a better public speaker. And I mean, I mean, I got the question a lot. So we actually made a whole presentations course about it that literally goes through all the tricks and tactics. But the thing that I want to instill in people, which is speaking is simply a strategy to spread a message. And there are many strategies to spread a message. You can make a film, you can write a book, you can have a social a media presence. You can find partnerships. You can build a business. There's millions of ways to do it. It's just one avenue. But first and foremost, you have to have a, a thing that compels you. Mm. And the reason is, is because you're going to get kicked on your ass a lot. And so unless you have compulsion, you'll give up. Another thing I noticed when we were at the <laughs> last conference together, mm. your name badge mm -hmm. said your name. Mm-hmm. And then your job, everyone else had like their title. Mm. So I, mine, mine was whatever the hell my title was at the time. Mm. Um, optimist. Mm -hmm. Have you always been an optimist throughout your life? Or is this something you've learned to cultivate? I mean, the answer is both, right? It's like somebody has some sort of facility and then they practice and they work really hard and they get really good at it. Like you're pretty good at basketball. And if you work really hard, you can get in the NBA, right? right? So yeah, my whole life, people called me happy-go-lucky, right? <laughs> That's what the term was when I was a kid. And then you know, you sort of work on it. You're like, okay, this seems to be an advantage. This seems to be something that will help me um, excel in whatever I'm trying to do. And I want to be defined by who I am, not what I do. Because, you know, I see this, you see this very often in success, successful people, right? Which is they spent their whole life being, um, pick a profession, an attorney. You know, since the age of 21, maybe 23, right? They're an, they're an attorney, right? Um and they do it for 20 years and 30 years, and they want to retire. And then the first thing that happens is they have an identity crisis. If I'm not an attorney, what am I? You know, or somebody who gets fired after a job for 20 years. They don't know what to do. CEOs who thought their value was that they were CEO, they're no longer the CEO. It's because what they did was they confused what they did. Or like, you know, look, look at someone's bio, right? That's, I think, the best place to look. Look at someone's bio. It says CEO of or Oscar-nominated actor of. So you're defining your entire self-worth based on a position you have mm. or something that you accomplished in the past that, by the way, every year is further and further away, right? When did you win your Oscar? 25 years ago, you know? That's your identity? And that's the problem. Mm. And I never wanted my bio to start with something I do, a it title was. I have, yeah. or something that I achieved in the past that who even cares, right? I wanted to be defined by who I am. So if you, if you look at my name, whenever I blurb a book, it'll always say, Optimist and best-selling author of dot, 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 right? Um, and no matter what I do, I will always be that. And no matter what job I have, and if I eventually retire, like, I will always be that. So yeah, that, that is by design. I want to be, I want to be, I, I want my title to be who I am, not what I do. So let's say we win the infinite game mm -hmm. as a civilization. 
<laughs> you can't win the okay. infinite game. You can just stay in the game. Sure. So I would argue that winning the infinite game of civilization is that we survive infinitely and we survive longer than we think. I had the great honor of getting to spend a little time with Dr. James Kars before he died. Mm. And uh, he was, first of all, a magical, magical guy and truly embodied an infinite mindset. And um, when I had told him that I'm writing a whole new book to build upon the foundation that he, that he built, that he, that he wrote, he was overjoyed because he recognized that his kooky little philosophy book that he wrote was going to have a longer life because I was going to pick it up and carry it on. So I w- I'm really honored by that, you know, that I feel like I'm carrying his torch and I'm really proud to carry his torch. So when we met for the first time, I think the first question I asked is, I, I, just when we sat down, I'm like, I have to ask you, how'd you come up with it? How did you come up with the concept of the infinite game? Because, you know, there are many people who, who espouse theories, but you put out a truth, an unassailable truth, and those don't happen very often. I mean, Galileo had one of those, Newton had one of those, You've got one of those. Like the number of people who, you know, that other people use your truth to explain the world. How the hell did you come up with it? Mm. And he said in the 1970s, they were, game theory was all the rage. And everybody was talking about game theory. And they would have these salons where they would bring sort of these uh, mixed groups of like an economist, uh, uh, you know, a theologian, uh, a mathematician, you know, whatever a philosopher, they'd have these salons and they would obsessively discuss game theory. And the prisoner's dilemma is one of the theories that emerged from one of these salons. Came out in the 1970s, right? And Dr. Kars, a theologian, was invited to these salons. And he realized after attending them that they were all talking about winning and losing. Like everybody, when they discussed game theory, they only discussed winning and losing. And he raised his hand and said, but what about playing? You're only talking about the outcome. What about the play? And that was stuck in his head. And he was at home and he realized something, which is when his kids were playing ping pong, for example, when his kids were playing a finite game, invariably there was screaming and shouting at some point. There was one player accusing the other person, accusing the other player of cheating. And it would, it was... N- not it didn't always end in, in, in well, but when the kids were doing something infinite, like they were playing with Lego, mm. they were drawing. He said it was quiet all day. One kid would join, one kid would leave, and it would like the players would come and go. And he realized that that we are so obsessed with winning that we sometimes forget about playing, and not all playing wins. Mm. So you can play ping pong or you can play Lego. And then you start to pull back and you realize so much of our world is actually more like Lego than it is about ping pong. So business, we, you play at business, you can't win at business. And so, and employees come and go, you know, but the company, the game continues. Um, And this was the problem with the obsession with game theory. Even today, almost all the discussion about game theory is how can I win or how can I get an advantage over you? And not enough discussion is about the joy and art of the play and playing. And um, that's what I love about it. And I have tried to build my business and live my life in in his vision, which is I'm, I'm, I'm having fun playing my life and I'm having fun playing in business, but I'm not trying to win or outdo anyone. Such a beautiful story. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. So win-win. Oh, yeah. I wish he was still alive. I know. He and I had a conversation during COVID and I didn't know what the, I just decided to just call him. I'm like, can we just have a conversation and just record it? He's like, yeah, sure. And so we recorded it. It was just a freewheeling conversation. And after he died, um, we, we cut it up and, and released it as a, an episode of my podcast. So you can hear him and his words. And he's, he laughs the whole time. He's just the best. I'll link to it after this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This is amazing. There we go. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. And huge thanks to Simon for speaking with me. Do go check out his stuff. 
Lots of links below to his books. I highly recommend you read The Infinite Game. It's so good. Uh, also in linked to a bunch of the other resources we touch on. If you enjoyed this, please like, please share. You can now splice it up on YouTube uh, and make your own little shorts out of it. Um, just, you know, spread the word. That's all for now. I'm very sweaty. My air conditioning's not working, so excuse the, uh, the listen. I will catch you all next time.